So Jennifer, how did you get the idea to do this show? Uh, this was actually a proposal that was sent to us by International Artists and Artists. And looking at the materials, I really thought it was the right fit for us in Montgomery because of you know, the, our film collection. So we do have an interest in textiles, but this is a whole other kind of textile that I thought would be fascinating and clearly you know, as everybody will see as we go through, the work is just extraordinarily beautiful, too. So once we saw the proposal, we thought, yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense to bring it here. Very excited to share it with everybody. So we get started. Beautiful mm -hmm. people, both small and very large. Um, <laughs> it's a whole amazing. range of stamps. A whole range of stamps. Amazing. You know, it's that. The variety of scale that we want to work in, which is really incredible. And a lot of them have been learning since 2002, so they have been doing it very long, which I think really shows their talent. There's a lot of raw talent in the Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start with the Everybody. You have 11 guests. Hello, oh, everybody. Get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday late afternoon, early evening. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, welcome to tonight's creative conversation. My name is Elizabeth Palmer. I'm an educator here at the museum. Welcome. Um, tonight I am joined with Dr. Jennifer Gankowski, one of our curators, as well as um, our camera woman is Alice Novak, one of my fellow educators here. And we welcome you to um, tonight's program where we'll be women, the work, and the art of independence. And this exhibition was organized by um, International Artists, Art and Artists um, in D.C. Um, with the Soviet Anacostia Community Center. And the curator is Ben Gibson, who is the co-founder of the Blue Blade Women, and James Green as well. And we just want to thank Ben Gibson for being a wonderful resource to Jennifer and I during this time helping us learn about these pieces and these women, as well as our co-sponsors, Laura and Eric Harmon, and Linda and Sanders, um, thank with um, our co-sponsors. Um, so thank you and welcome everybody to tonight. Um, feel free to ask us questions in the comments. Um, Alex will be, let it, will chime in and let us know, so it will be back. And we also hope you'll join us on September 2nd for a pre-recorded conversation with them. Um, it's pre-recorded because in South Africa, they're seven hours ahead, so they can't be with us at 5.30 our time. Um, so we'll do an earlier conversation that shows that our 5.30 time. So with that, I think I covered everything. I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer um, to introduce us to the amazing women um, behind me. work. Thank you, Elizabeth. And again, we are so excited here at the MMA at 
host this exhibition. It is extraordinarily beautiful, as I'm sure you'll see as we go around and look at some of these pieces in depth. What the Boucle is, is an artist community in, um, the, in, in South Africa, and it was formed in 1999 by two women, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more depth in a moment, but I wanted to kind of explain the process of what these women are doing. They are reimagining um, the Nwango cloth, which is reminiscent of the cloth that they wore in their headscarves, skirts, and things that they were wearing in their culture of Kosa. And um, they're using these last beads from the Czech Republic. And these beads are smaller than the grain of rice. And they're using thread and needle and these beads to create these really dazzling works of art that for many of them are personal narratives, others are a little bit more abstract, but they're really painting with beads. And as we walk around and see these extraordinary works of art, I think you'll really get some insight into who these women are. So let's take a step over here. We are um, lucky enough to have some portraits that um, the photographer, the very well-known photographer who works in South Africa, Sanandi Mwoli, but she's an artist and an activist, and she's really known to champion women in South Africa, including the, the women that are part of the Ukulele community. But I really wanted to focus first on this double portrait, because these are the two founders of Ukulele. So on the left here, you have uh, Notabella, and also then right here. And the two of them, like I said before, formed this community in 1999, and they work on Little Farm, which is actually a um, sugarcane plantation, and uh, is north of Durban, South Africa, and it's land that Beth had. And she is not of herself, but has been such an enthusiastic supporter and champion of these women, and has really brought them to recognition and helped them. And, and the whole community is really about these women coming together, living on the farm, working together, elevating their skills, selling their materials so that they can have a sustainable future for themselves and their families. So that support has been crucial to the Bukai community. But it wouldn't really exist without Induna, who, um, as I mentioned, her name is actually no to Bethy, but she's called Nduna, which is a great term of respect. It means leader in South Africa. And she is a master leader. And she learned from her grandmother and has uh, really taken beating to an entirely different level and has actually taught many of the women who are part of the community. And some of her sisters and other relatives are part of the community as well. In the exhibition, we have a wonderful video where many of the artists are talking, and we're going to share a little excerpt of that now with a couple of the artists who will introduce themselves, and that way you get a sense of who these women are. Sandilin Tovela, and now I'm doing the down for the
moving on to our next two pieces. Turn over here. Maybe we can get closer so you can really see some detail. Um, these two pieces um, are really wonderful um, examples of the, the, the Wongo um, being sites of memory. These pieces, as we go through the exhibition, are very personal to these women. Um, the figures that you see, the trees, the cows, um, the bulls, the children, these are all representative of either the women themselves or people they know, um, places that have great meaning to them. And these women turn to beadwork um, as sort of like a therapy to remember. Um, and so this piece here is our first one by Sando Notabella. She's in one of Induna's sisters. And this is called Goodbye Little Farm. And Little Farm is in the Midlands Meander in South Africa. And it was purchased by Bev and her children. And they invited the Abuzle women and their children to Little Farm, not just to live, but to provide a place um, where the women can work, um, allow them to focus on their craft and the um, creating um, the Nwangos. And also the space allowed them to put a shop together where the women could sell their beaded jewelry and gain financial independence, which is really wonderful. And so Goodbye Little Farm was created in 2011. And I'm, I should have said, um, they moved to Little Farm in 2002. So about nine years later in 2011, Little Farm was broken into and robbed. Um, it was very sad and tragic. And the Abukle women were not in a strong financial position. And because of the damage of that crime, they thought they'd have to sell Little Farm. And it's very sad. And so Sando turned to beadwork to remember this utopia, this wonderful place that meant so much to these women and their children, their families to bed. Um, and put this together here, you can see the artist who she put um, herself in. We have two children holding hands. Um, we have, it looks like a horse with another figure over here. And then this figure here is their collie sock at the time. And so that's really sweet. And it's just really personal and a wonderful memory of their time there. I have good news. They didn't have to sell a little farm. They were able to turn around, thankfully. Um, and where they are with Little Farm, they're on a very popular highway with tourists. And so they, they're in a great spot to you know, sell their beadwork and um, these tapestries. So good news, they didn't have to sell. Wonderful, we're still there. Um, and so we're gonna go over just a little bit to the next piece, which is by um, Bongiswa Notabella, another sister. Um, who unfortunately passed away at an early age and before this exhibition was organized. Okay, okay. Um, and so just a little bit, um, this piece is called Thank You. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about who Bongiswa was. She um, was a woman who was denied a Western education. And since she couldn't go to the classroom, she turned to nature and God um, and to be work. And through that, she was able to grow um, in confidence. And as a master bead work, once her work started getting attention and selling, and she was able to gain that financial independence, which if you think about your own, you feel really good and you feel confident. And she was able to have that. And so this piece here, like I said, very personal, um, not only the, the Nwangos, but for Bongiswa um, as a gift to Bev Gibson, the co-founder. Um, so Abukwe um, was co-founded by Induna and Bev. And Induna brought the artist side and Bev, not an artist, brought a business side to it. With her experience, she was able to secure loans that could help get the business off the ground. Um, and so because of that, the opportunity to create 
of creating the fitness, giving these women a chance to earn their own money, um, meant so much to Bongisla and the other women that um, Bongisla created this thank you to them. Um, and there's an inscription um, that goes with this piece. And um, Bongisla never told Bev what it meant, and Induna won't tell her um, yet. But Bev is um, hopeful that she will learn what it means. And what else can I say about this piece? Um, oh, Bev, while I was talking to her, again, a wonderful resource, um, just a personal connection. She said she thought this was a wonderful example of the exchange of talent, time, resources, and skills that the women and the gave each other. Um, you know, Bungie's were creating this work, thanking them um, for all what she does. And it's just a wonderful relationship. And I think these two pieces are, again, wonderful examples of Also, these women positive and um, spirit, positive attitude um, towards life, other, um, and the community that they built on Little Farm. Um, so these are these two pieces. And again, if you guys have any questions about these pieces, you want to get a closer look, um, write in the comments. Um, Alice will she's keeping an eye on it. So um, with that, we will move forward into the next gallery. that are grouped together to remember those that were lost. Unfortunately, since 2006, the Abukle community has lost about uh, five women to HIV, AIDS, and other illnesses, almost halving their whole community. So there's only maybe six other active women working in Abukle today. Uh, these works on this wall and one other piece are all from members who have passed away. And um, they're included here because, you know, they're so important to all of the women. For the women who are creating new works, they do them often in memory of their sisters. In fact, this piece here by Sambani Rosabello is actually the sister of Ansuiga and um, Indunia and several of the others. There, there's, like I said, so many close relationships between the, these women. And this piece here is so interesting to me because when I heard about the story, I'm not sure that I would have understood what the narrative was here by looking at this piece. It comes across as something very abstract. But in essence, what it is, it's called Zulu Dance Ear Club. And what it is is that Namani was reaching back to when she was a young girl and her earliest memory of watching Zulu men perform dances. And the men would be incredibly energetic. You know, their feet would be kicking up dust everywhere from the ground, uh, just really exuberant. And I think you see that energy and exuberance here. But she was fascinated by the earplugs that the men would wear, that the Zulu men, the dancers would wear in their earlobes. They were big cylinders that would have brass pins, uh, sometimes wood. And I think you're sort of seeing that in these circular shapes that are reminiscent of what these earplugs were. And for her, she was just fascinated by the energy and the movement and would say, they, they would tease her because she would say, I'm not sure if the earplugs were creating the motion or the dancers were creating the motion. And so for her, it was really about the motion. Again, not necessarily being able to identify exactly in such a clear way as some of these other pieces do what the subject is. But once you know the story, you can feel the energy that she was bringing to the work. So Alice is going to kind of pan around and look at some more of these pieces in this gallery. And what 
This gallery also has is a number of works of women that are still part of the collective and they are working today. I do want to talk about this piece here. This is a work by Zambale Ongamela, and she is the sister of um, Sando Ansliga and of course Junya. And this piece was actually created not long after um, Zambani and Ansliga passed away, which was really unfortunate. Normally they would go home and grieve with their family members in their ancestral home. But they had been commissioned to create some new works for an exhibition in New York, and they couldn't pass by the opportunity. So they needed to continue to work. And like I said, you know, these, and Elizabeth mentioned, these works often take up to 10 months to a year to complete. And as this work was being started not long after her sisters passed away, it really was a way for them to reflect on their sister as they were working through everything, using this as a way of grieving, but also thinking about their sister's spirits. This piece is a little bit easier to understand the narrative. If you look here, you can see a landscape on this end for that lush verdant green area that really makes you think about looking up into the mountains. And of course, this here is the sky on the other side. It's called Heaven and Earth Become One. And for Sandile, what she was really thinking about was looking at the time of sunset, almost looking towards the mountains, seeing how the colors started blending together, where you almost couldn't, you know, make it discernible, you know, where mountains ended and where sky started, and it was all coming together before you would go into pitch black. And of course, that blackness then was symbolic, not only for the grief that she was experiencing, but also thinking about, you know, the heavens and the sky and her sister's spirit, of course, moving upward into the heavens. So Elizabeth is going to talk about another work of women that are still working in the community today. And as we move through the gallery, Alex, again, we'll pan over um, Jennifer, um, these women are still with me as we play um, in our time a little over. We're going to come over to this corner and talk about this piece that's very connected, um, um, very connected to heaven and earth become one. Um, this piece here is called My Sea, My Sister, My Tears. Um, these two pieces were created at the same time. Um, they had a show in New York that they were preparing for at the same time they had lost their sisters. Um, so there was a time of grieving. Um, another thing that happened because, you know, when it rains, it pours oh, water. Um, they, an artist, um, Sham Abu Bakar, um, sent them photos of his work of dying indigo cloth. Um, and the women were so inspired by how the cloth changed, how it became a deeper, darker color, how it, you know, stayed a lighter shade. Um, and so these, um, these artists created works um, with water and it plays with the shades, the dark colors, the lighter shades that you see here brighter. Um, and so they're inspired, they have a show, they've lost their sister. Um, and traditionally, the women would have gone back to their homes um, to grieve with their families. But because of the show, they stayed on Little Farm to create these pieces. Um, of what was, I guess, helpful during that time is that their mother and um, one of their little sisters um, came to Little Farm to help them on these pieces. And they were able to talk about their sisters with their family members, with their sister's children. And these children have this opportunity to hear about their mother in a new way that they probably wouldn't have heard about. Um, so it's very therapeutic and a way to get that grieving out. Um, and so with the inspiration from, um, they call the artist Rafka because of his dreadlocks. 
Um, because of Rapta with the dark color um, turning to water, water is very important to Induna. It is the source of life. Um, in a letter to Rapta, she explains that um, we are all blue inside because we are made of water. Um, and so water has this wonderful symbolism of life and strength. And so she's created this sea here um, and with water taking on this life form. And you can see through these shades, the different emotional stages of grief that she's going through. These dark colors um, are very stormy and that represents the anger she feels um, that she misses her sister, her sister's been taken away. And these more lighter, brighter colors are showing um, and meant to symbolize the happy times that they're remembering about their sister, the joy that she brought to their lives. Um, and so again, a wonderful, wonderful piece um, of memory, this personal connection um, that these works have to the, their creators. And because of um, a letter that Beth shared with me, um, it's very personal, but it gave me a new understanding of this work and when heaven and earth become one. Um, what's also really wonderful are the little the swirls of color of water. Um, in some areas, it looks really stormy, and then others look much more calm. And so, I think that really captures the the grief feeling. You go through waves. I ah, did it again. Um, <laughs> of joy and then sorrow and um, anguish. Um, so it's just a really beautiful piece. I really, really enjoyed learning about this, um, this one and the student's work. So with that, we'll go forward to, um, I guess our fourth gallery, but um, our third one of artists that are still active. Um, now we're gonna go around the other side of the gallery. And then this upcoming, Sorry, mispronouncing. Kusa and Zulu people. Bulls are um, a way that they uh, calculate their wealth and their use as dowry or wedding um, traditions, and uh, really an important part of the culture. So I really wanted to share this piece with you. Um, you know, actually, all of the women were inspired by bulls. As Alice just showed you a number in the gallery. They have bulls around them, not far from Little Farm. And they have taken several day trips out to look at the bulls, get inspired by them, um, look at their mannerisms, and really find ways that they want to then represent them in their work. They take photographs and videos on their cell phones so that they have that for reference. And then they come back and create these wonderful pieces uh, this work here is by Zanfile Zalo, and she is actually the only Zulu member of the Ojibwe community. And you know, that is really representative of what you see here by the colors that she uses. That is the reds and the brighter colors, these primary colors are, are very much associated with the Zulu traditions. It's really interesting that has shared with us that um, Zanili is actually considered to be probably the most conservative women, woman in the group. She is um, a very religious, a strict mother, somebody who is really very much a rule follower. But in her work, her wild side comes out because of these colors that she's incorporating in, and all of the other women tease her about that. Uh, this piece actually has two titles. The first title is I Am Ill, and um, I still see color and beauty. Beauty, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, when she started this piece, she actually became very ill. 
Um, Zalile is um, diabetic and she has very high blood pressure. And at one point she was almost hospitalized. But throughout that, she really maintained a sense of positivity. And, you know, again, looking at this through that whole period, it takes almost 10 months to create a panel like this. She experienced so many different things. So in addition to her dealing with her illness and working through it and wanting these bright colors to, to really explore the beauty of colors and her favorite colors, which she says are red and pink, and orange, and in fact, apparently she always has a little bit of red or pink on her body somewhere. She's always wearing those colors every day, even though the rest of her dress is often very austere. Um, but here with this ball, she's used those colors, but she has also created other areas. If you see here, the silver bead, uh, this is a river, and then she has some blue coming off of that too to kind of make the water look a little bit more transparent. Um, she has the blue sky above, of course, and then this green, and she says that's because uh, she knew her cow needed to eat, and so she wanted to make sure that there was some grass there. There's a second title to this piece, and it is uh, Jamudi Bowl, and that is because it is in reference to her father. She, um, her father was somebody she just really loved and admired very deeply, and when she was younger, she has this memory um, from when she was younger of her father bringing in the cattle and there was a, a red bull that would kind of shriek and cry. And so that cry always for her, even though you would think a crying bull wouldn't be something good, it actually was a happy memory for her because it meant that her father was about done with his short and done with working with the cattle and was coming back home so that she could be with him again. So, that's why she has the second title for this piece, and that this bowl is very much in memory of her father. We're going to enter the last gallery right now, and in this gallery, we have one of the most spectacular works in the exhibition. So as you can see, this is really a monumental piece. This is the African Crucifixion, and it was created by seven different members of the Bootleg community all working together. Uh, this piece, you can see, is in different panels. And while, of course, it was clearly a crucifixion, and it was commissioned for a church in Petersburg, Petersburg, <laughs> and uh, apparently that's a very sort of simple church, but they have a skylight, and we're looking for a monumental piece for behind their altar. I knew with the skylight, this would be so wonderful with the light catching the bees that it would just shine in that space. And uh, Njuni really was the one who sort of shepherded this whole process and really inspired the ideas behind this work, but they all collaborated together. And if you look closely, there's a theme of trees running throughout this whole work. And you can see on the far left, the two panels on the bottom, this is the tree of defeat. And in this work, you'll see that on the lower left corner, there is a bull bones that are you know, really dealing with the idea of death, the colors are more muted, they're browns and sand kind of color that references the droughts that they've had. Uh, on top, you'll see there are a couple of vultures there. The vultures, of course, you know, reference death again too, but also they're symbolic of politicians in South Africa who are not looking out for people. And under the tree branch, you'll see, of course, the ribbons that symbolize um, the fight against HIV and AIDS, which has been a very big crisis in Africa. So that's the piece that sort of starts this narrative of the trees and the crucifixion. The piece on the top left is the storm, and very much you can see that bolt of lightning, um, the, the colors of that gold and that flash of lightning. And for them, the storm is both destructive, of course, 
you know, the winds and uh, damage that can be brought on by a storm, but it also is um, something that is healing, the rains of renewal that bring new growth. And so they really wanted to emphasize that as well. Elizabeth, you want to talk yeah. about some of the other panels? So as we move to the right of um, this past previous fiction, up on top to follow the storm is after the storm. And it's very um, symbolic, not just, you know, that calm, that final release from the turbulence of, you know, thunder and lightning, but there's a sense of hope. And that's what this half, this second half is all about. Um, after the storm, it's calm, it's a new period. And it's very symbolic too, um, not just biblically, but also for South, South, South Africa, of a positive time period of pol harmful policy being rolled back. And, you know, just the women too, this new community as well. And as we um, go down underneath the stars and the moon, you see the tree of life. Again, that positive, um, hopeful, new beginning imagery. Um, I think if we can get closer, we can see the birds and the butterflies a little better. Colors, uh, bright colors that are in sort of contrast to, to the tree um, on the left side and the bones of the bull. Um, following the tree of life are John and Mary, um, our host. And this was sort of meant to symbolize, um, I guess, not just biblical symbolism, but also to these women that um, their families are getting a new chapter with the blue blade that they're gaining financial independence, but their children will take this legacy and carry it on, just as Mary and John carry on the legacy of Christ. And then we come to the centerpiece here of the African crucifixion, which was um, created by um, Tiffany, who um, the women lost to um, HIV and AIDS um, related illnesses, um, which makes the uh, and much more impactful or meaningful because that loss was incredibly personal and um, heartbreaking, uh, heartbreaking for them. And the way that Simbani has depicted Christ, um, you know, while her illnesses, she's able to relate to Christ as he's dying on the cross. Um, you see his body is very thin, it's warm. You can see his ribs and the injuries um, that he has. And she, in a way, she's in that with him. Um, and she also becomes, you know, it's kind of like a cross like figure herself and her illness and her loss um, in the community. Um, so this is a very, um, also a very personal piece to the Abuja community. Um, and it's included um, because of the women that they've lost too. It's such a, you know, a monumental piece. And it was the last major work that Simone created. So, you know, this was her final contribution to the Ubuntu community, but her presence continues to inspire all of the women, as do the other women that they lost and each other. It's a very supportive environment, and they all work very closely together. Yeah. I mean, just loving and positive and supportive. I mean, these women are truly inspirations. Um, to go through hardships and still create something so beautiful and intricate. It's just, mm -hmm. I'm inspired and I hope you guys are too. So um, that's our big final piece. Um, are there any questions? Um, Al is going to go around and see the this gallery. You see a lot of trees in the sun. These words. Um, and this piece is actually unfinished. Um, we did include that. Um, it's a little dark, I'm sorry. Um, but this is all beaded here. And then right here in the face, um, they've left the black cloth. It, it, it almost unfinished. looks like a mask. It almost <laughs> does look like a mask. Yeah, it's like she's wearing a mask. Yes. Um, and so that's, I mean, that just shows you the, the small. Um, threads that they're they're weaving into with the beads and 
What's also really interesting, and we had this question when we were talking about this with our docents, is that um, the question was asked whether they sketch out their designs ahead of time. And in fact, they do not. They actually don't put any markers down on their cloths. It's all straight out of their imagination. They just sit down and very confidently pick up their beads and create what's in their head onto the cloth. And sometimes it's a, a physical idea like the bulls or trees, but other times it's just a feeling and it's more abstract. And that's just, I'm in awe of the people who can do that. So Penny has asked us for a tight close up so that we can see some of the beadwork. Oh, yeah. So I hope the rest of you will be getting your questions ready for us as we get close here for a moment. So we have a question from Megan. What type of beading stitches do they use? You know, I, I, I don't know if there is a type, like a specific type, because in Zuna learned from her mother, um, and this is something that's been passed down. I know that there's black and crystal beads. There's, yeah, it's last beads from the Czech Republic. They tried Chinese beads and other beads, and they've gone back to check these because they order them from cards and the color our most suit those cards and the consistency is the same all the time. It's such a high quality beauty these last seeds and that's why they continue to order from the Czech Republic. And actually the, the last seeds from the Czech Republic have a long history going back to the early 19th century of bringing these beads to South Africa. So it is fitting within that tradition too. Now, on the videos, you'll see them actually doing some of the sewing. And what they do is they actually pick up multiple beads on the needle, I would say, like three, four, not too many more than that. And then they, they just sew them into the cloth. Um, but as I'll show you the close up, I mean, the amount of beads on each panel is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not really seeing individual stitches. If there's a name for the stitch, I am unaware of that. Yeah, I've asked Bev um, because um, we'll also have an Instagram series with the artist. Um, they have an Instagram who play beads. And right, right now, what they're going to be showing close up pictures of what they're currently working on. And that can also give you a good idea of how intricate and involving these are. Very meticulous. Very process. meticulous. So when we get um, our, that will be on um, Saturday, I'm hoping August 29th, where we can show you them working. And you can see how many beads they pick up with the needle. Um, and they're very quick with it. They're very quick. Um, I thank God that put some in slow motion because I would have, I would have caught it. Um, but I don't, but she didn't give me a name for stitching type that they, they do. They just take a needle, thread, and eat, and they just mm -hmm. do the magic that they do. And Penny is asking about the weight of this artwork with these beads. Oh, be yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can be very heavy, as you, as you can see. We have some metal supports here. Um, this is a, a very intricate piece to install. But yes, the, the, 
they are glass beads. Again, they're not plastic, so that does give it a lot of extra weight. Um, so yeah, they are heavy. Good question. Any other questions? That might be all of the questions. We have a lot of comments that things are gorgeous and spectacular and colorful and thanks for sharing. We are hopeful that we'll be able to open our doors again soon. We would love to have people come in and see the exhibition. And the exhibition goes through October 15th, maybe in October. So fingers crossed, everybody. Fingers crossed. It really is wonderful to see in person. It, it is hard to get over a video, but these pieces just glow with the light. I mean, it's really hard to wrap your mind around almost. They're, they're really incredible and spectacular. They're just exquisite works of art. And they, these women in this collection, the Duco women, have really transformed this craft into an art form. Mm -hmm. They've done a great job. And they use different glass beads too, which is not just one type, but several different bigger beads, mm -hmm. smaller beads, and um, some metallic, some metallic that you can see on the right. Um, it's really, really incredible. So we hope that we can share it with you eventually. Um, but in the meantime, please join us um, on Instagram August 29th and um, September 2nd with Beth Gibson. And if you have questions for her, if she is a fascinating lady, Full of knowledge, um, please submit questions early on the Facebook event page and on our website. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful